Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope that you are well. My name is Katie Cush, and I am an Alumni Relations Officer at the Rhode Island School of Design. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Anchoring and Awakening Your Creative Practice During Crisis. Before I introduce today's presenter, I'd like to go over a few things first. Today's webinar will run roughly 90 minutes, leaving us plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. And we're going to do something a little bit different for this webinar. So if you've attended some of mine in the past, this might be uh, a little bit of a surprise. So uh, at the very beginning, Hillary, our presenter, will ask you to use the chat section. And later on during the webinar, we will revisit that. But uh, at another point in the webinar, Hillary is going to invite you to contribute if you'd like. So if you would, we ask that you please use the raise hand feature and I'll go ahead and un unmute you. And we just ask that until then, you please remember to keep your microphone muted. If you um, didn't catch what I just said, I did include that in the chat section here. Hi, Stefan. Um, thank you for coming. So any questions, you can also reach me in the chat and I'll be able to help you. Just want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the RISD alumni website under the learning section within the next 10 days. I have also turned the closed captioning option on if you need it and you can find the button to access that at the bottom of your screen. So um, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Hillary Foreman is a life and creativity coach and founder of the Lightheart Society. She believes that who you are and what you create is powerful beyond measure. Hillary envisions a world of creatives fully reconnecting to their unique genius, luminously living their calling, and igniting a wildfire of change. Hillary has a BFA from RISD in photography. She studied yoga and meditation and is an Awaken Your Life certified master life coach. She has spent 16 years in advertising and taking the leap into the unknown of her calling taught her the power of courageous creation. She has a mission to lean into discomfort on a regular basis. This practice often results in creative inspiration, new friends, and interesting stories. Past experiments have included trekking in Nepal, writing a children's book, and learning how to surf. Her personal mantra is, from Mary Oliver's poetry, be ignited or be gone. I'll send it over to you, Hillary. Hi, thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. So if you can, in the chat box, just let me know what your greatest creative practice challenge is right now. Um, and that'll be how we sort of get to know each other to start. I'll be wait for some additional people to join us too. Okay. You are currently muted, yes. Time and time management. Time, lots of time. Staying creative when time is limited. Procrastination. Procrastination is my biggest one, mm -hmm. Courtney. I agree. Staying motivated. Self doubt. Mm, too many ideas. I feel you on that one. Time inspiration. Stress. All of the above. Yes. Uh, Depression, creativity under pressure, sticking with the habit, starting a lot of projects and not finishing any of them. Oh, wonderful. I have something for you later. Um, workspace equals living space. Yes. Limiting creative ideas, focusing, not wanting to self-promote. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Passive is easier. Allowing time for art to take precedence over family. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yes, all of this. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to close the chat so I can no longer see it, but um, Katie can. So if there is a question, um, she will see it. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and get started. A couple more coming in. What to say in time of crisis, balance. Okay, got it. Okay, you guys are all in the right place, so good news. Okay. First off, I just want to let you know who I am. Katie did a great job introducing me, so this will be 
pretty brief. Um, but yes, my name is Hillary Foreman. My pronouns are she, her. I did go to RISD and, and have a degree in photography. And I live um, here in beautiful um, Portland, Oregon. And I um, am both a creative and a creative coach. Um, and the reason that I wanted to do this um, webinar for RISD is because um, throughout the past year during um, the craziness of 2020 and into 2021, I was seeing with my clients and with myself um, that there was an incredible challenge that was being presented. Something that um, really I was not taught by anyone how to handle. Um, and it was something that I thought might be helpful for the RISD alumni group um, and creatives in general to sort of bring up as a topic. Um, this isn't something that we learned in school. There was no class on how to do this, right? So um, I really came at this from a place of service and really just wanting to help other people um, because I was seeing it pop up everywhere. So before we dive right in, a couple of quick agreements. Um, I want you to be here now. So what that means is close the tabs, put your phone on mute, close the door. The greatest gift that we can give ourselves and others is the gift of our attention. Also ask for what you need. So Katie is here. She is monitoring the chat box. Um, if you need something repeated or you have a question, she is going to handle all of that for us. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and if you need to um, turn your video off. Um, I believe it's actually already off. So um, it's already off. No worries. Um, it, or just any, any way you have a question, just ask for what you need and um, we will do our best to help. And then release judgment. So I feel like there can be a lot of um, self-judgment that comes up whenever um, things that are true are reflected to us. So I ask that you really approach this from a place of compassion um, and awareness. So if you see something and you're like, oh my gosh, that's me, having so much compassion and love for yourself and really releasing the judgment about what is and, and what was. Um, additionally, we are going to be doing some brief journaling. So you'll need a pencil and a paper. So go ahead and grab that. Our agenda today, uh, first we're gonna talk about creativity in crisis. So why is creativity extra challenging during a crisis? Um, how does it affect us at a core level? And then your response to stress. So how do um, creatives tend to respond to stress and why it matters? There'll be three high level archetypes there um, and we'll do some journaling along the way as well. And then finally, we'll talk about a resilient creative practice. So that'll be a space where we can evaluate and customize your own anchored creative practice. Um, all along the way, we will have um, some structure to it. So there will be a moment for um, taking deep breaths to ground us into our body. Um, there'll be a moment for journaling. It'll be brief. And then there will be a moment for discussion where you'll raise your hand and um, Katie will unmute you so you can ask questions. So first, we're going to take five deep breaths. So close your eyes, settle yourself in your chair or your seat. Let your feet be flat on the ground and inhale through your nose. And then just let it go. We're gonna do that four more times. Inhale. Just flutter your eyes back open. That's to bring you back into your body. Maybe you haven't taken a deep breath today. And that is going to be something that we're going to continue to do throughout our time today. Part of the reason is because I want to bring your, your nervous system out of that sort of stress crisis mode and into something more relaxing because I feel you can um, integrate information better when you have relaxed. 
So um, you're going to be doing a little bit more breathing today than you would normally do in a webinar. <laughs> so. so to begin, I want to make sure that um, we, I mean, I know that we all know that creativity matters. You wouldn't be here if it didn't matter to you. Um, and I think while we know that creativity matters, I don't know that we spend that much time really thinking about why. So um, I think that I just wanted to take a moment and say that it matters a lot. <laughs> and I think we know that, right? But internally, it's an outlet for processing emotion and cultivating self-knowledge. And that's something that we really need during these times. And then externally, it also acts as a bridge between people and it offers connection, empathy, and community. And I think we all need that, especially now. When our ability to access our creativity is threatened, it can feel like you're holding your breath too long. It can feel as if you, you're frustrated. You know that it's important to you. You know that it's an integral part of who you are and yet it's not happening. It's just nothing is there. And that feeling of like having something that you need to want to express and yet feeling blocked about it is um, it's very overwhelming, frustrating, um, and things can start to come out sideways. And so cultivating this creative practice is, um, is really going to be helpful um, and important because of course the creativity matters and our ability to access it matters. Pre-2020, there were tons of ways that life could get in the way of your creativity. So not enough time, energy, money, that is the number one thing. And I saw that in the chat box as well. Um, life gets in the way of creativity. It just does. Cover, covering over um, all the shoulds, like, oh, I want to go paint, but I should do this. Or I, you know, just all of the shoulds that we get in our life, in our society, in our work. Um, and really um, just letting that sort of cloud over um, the priority of um, the creative practice. And then also, but not least, in, it's an intimidating and vulnerable process <laughs> to be creative. And sometimes it's simply easier to not go there. Um, and so this is all the ways that, that pre-2020, just regular old life got in the way of creativity. And then 2020 happened. <laughs> Let's talk about creativity during crisis. And not just during a crisis, during converging crisis, crises. So in 2020, at the beginning of the year, I felt as if the people that were coming in my practice were, were really coming with it from that sort of just life getting in the way of the creative practices. And then all of a sudden, there weren't just one crisis, but they seem to layer on top of each other. We had COVID-19, we had Black Lives Matters, we had a crisis around our climate, fires and all kinds of things like that. And all of a sudden it was converging in a way that it had never done before. Um, and I would say if there was a graph of like creative challenge and life challenge intersecting, it would just go off the charts as you can imagine in 2020. Um, and that intersection of multiple crises um, impacts us at a core level. We can't control the crisis or crises, but we can bring awareness to how we respond to it. Threat, which is what we experience during crisis, is the inability to predict the immediate future and the inability to accurately respond to your current environment. And I think it's pretty fair to say that we were unable to predict the future and unable to respond. So it's not a surprise that we're all feeling threat. 
Lisa Congdon, she's an illustrator here in Portland, Oregon, says, being creative in times of stress is like running in hot, humid weather. It's possible. It just takes more effort. And I put that here because I want there to be some levity, but also because it is possible if we can take a look at it. And effort here, I think, is a little bit of what we're going to talk about. It's not necessarily effort as much as awareness. So this is your container. Um, the picture here is a tea samovar for those who are curious. But what this container represents is your capacity, yourself, to handle the ups and downs of life. And different people have different capacities. Um, depending on all kinds of different factors. And stressful events fill your container up. So if you imagine for a moment that you are a container, your container can look different than this one, and you have your just regular day-to-day -day ups and downs of life. Imagine that as water filling the container. So that water is just the daily stresses of that day-to-day pre-pandemic life. Life, work, money, relationships, health, challenges that come up in the day-to-day. -day. And you can sort of imagine, depending on the person, how that different level would be. When your container is in crisis, you're taking that regular level of water in your container and then you're adding on to it the global pandemic, a challenged economy, political unrest, the systemic racism, climate change, the results of all these things. And you can see how it would start to easily get over the limit of the container. And when that happens, your container overflows. And that overflow is it looks like performance changes, shifts in your creative practice, pain in your body even. Essentially, whatever your current results may be are a result of that container and where it may be and how you are managing the levels within that self-container. That level of threat is also our level of threat. It's a threat to safety. And that threat to safety is a threat to creativity because we need to have safety for creativity. And just to imagine for a moment, um, if you were you know, a, a caveman under stress, right? There's a tiger coming. Um, you're gonna go into your fight, flight, freeze, um, stress response. You're not going to pause and paint on the side of the cave, right? So you have to fundamentally have safety in order to be able to, to get to that creativity. So I've talked about converging crises. <laughs> I've talked about stress and how it shows up. And so I am going to take a moment here and we're going to breathe in a different way and then we're going to do a journal prompt. And so again, closing your eyes, letting your feet land on the floor, getting comfortable in your seat. And this time you're going to take your hand and put it in front of your mouth. And you're going to, uh, almost like you're fogging a mirror. So that, like your hand is a mirror and you're trying to fog the mirror. And as you make that fogging the mirror sound, you're gonna close your mouth. So it sounds like this, if you can hear that. So we're gonna inhale in through the nose and then keeping your mouth closed. So inhale, one, two, We're gonna do that three more times. Good. 
And then just allow your eyes to open. The reason I wanted to do that is because even just talking about stress can make our body feel the stress again. And I want you to connect to yourself because we're going to move into a journal prompt. So the journal prompt will be three minutes. And what I'm wanting you to answer is, sorry, trying to pull up my timer. Um, what I want you to answer is, what are your current container results or your current stress results, given all that has been going on in the last almost full, full year? <clears throat> so if your daily stress was already quite high, and then the pandemic's added to that, what is the overflow that you're currently seeing in your life and work? So that's three minutes starting now, and I'll give you a heads up when um, there's 30 seconds left. about halfway through. And we have 30 seconds left to wrap up. Okay, so we're going to move into our discussion section next. So I wanted to have a moment for reflection uh, for those that don't want to share, which was the journaling. And now we're going to move into a little bit of discussion. And so um, Katie's going to help us out. So if you have something that you would like to um, ask about as around um, the stress container, about your current results, um, you can uh, use the raise your hand and um, Katie will unmute you and we'll see if we can have a discussion um, that's organized. <laughs> Take a second. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead, uh, Lorenzo, I'm gonna allow you to talk now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Success. Great. Yes. Great. Um, 
so I just, um, I find that I'm actually in a moment right now. And I mean, I'm sure this isn't the case for everybody, but I feel like I actually do have enough time right now to make art because, because of the pandemic, my previous employment ended. So, and my previous job was really stressful. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm actually in a moment where I have enough time and I feel like I should be having the correct energy to make art. Um, but I feel like I'm having a hard time getting out of that mentality that I was in, where I was just constantly stressed and constantly putting out fires mm -hmm. in, at my job, at my old job. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, I feel like my container is still full, even though it shouldn't be, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to essentially uh, empty it out more. So that's mm -hmm. something, it's almost more in my head than it is in real life. That's, um, and that's pretty clear to me. So yeah, I'm curious to hear what you think. <laughs> um, first of all, I fully resonate with this experience. Um, after 16 years in advertising, when I left, it took me, I had the exact same experience. Um, I didn't know what to do with myself. I, I was so used to sending thousands of emails in a month um, that I was like, what do I do now? I didn't even, I didn't know how to rest. And, um, cause nobody taught me how to rest. And that is something that I see a lot for folks that, um, were burnt out or overwhelmed or overstressed when they stop being in that environment or that situation that was really stressful. Um, when they come out of it, it's like they have to readjust to what life is like not in that stressful situation. And so when you say that, yes, your container needs to continue to be emptied, absolutely. Um, I think paying attention to the things that empty your container is really important. It's not gonna be the same as what empties somebody else's container. And that could, you know, you know better than anybody else what empties that container for you. Um, but things like uh, really deep rest. So things like, and we'll talk about this more, but um, things like meditation, yoga, sleep, which is like a radical revolutionary idea, <laughs> naps, um, things that really feel restorative to you. Um, are going to help to empty that out. Um, I don't even want to go and call it self-care because it's beyond that. It's really um, being able to recover and return to yourself. Does that make sense? Uh, I think- Oh, sorry, yeah, there, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so I thought somebody- um, yeah, no, that's actually really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it'll come down to maybe just being able to find uh, what it is that can empty it out. Yeah, I mean, paying attention to what works, essentially. Mm -hmm. for, but um, yeah, that's, thank you very much. I, I, I look forward to hearing what you have to say uh, mm -hmm. in, the night, in, the, in the presentation, but thank you. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's an interesting, um, I mean, I'll have to just kind of keep uh, paying attention. Yes. Oh, the aware. Yes. Yes. Um, awareness is like the first step. So. Keep yeah. Going. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Hillary, we have three other folks who would like to contribute if you're okay. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute you. So here we go. Okay. Um. Gay Shemp, you should be able to unmute yourself and so I, you should be able to speak now if you still want to contribute. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Oh, hello, hello. Um, Hi. Uh, after months, I'm, I'm from Connecticut and uh, when my studio shut down uh, and I was unable to access my art supplies, my studio, my practice for months, um, I then had under, underwent hip surgery. So uh, it resulted in about six months of being out of the studio. And now I'm having a hell of a time getting back into it. Mm -hmm. I've never had this problem. I've been an, a professional artist my whole life and a teacher. 
And mm -hmm. it's baffling me. I'm spending too much time looking at the news and writing in my journals and mm -hmm. then time to go to the studio. Oh no, maybe I have to uh, do the laundry or something. I mm -hmm. find other ways to get in the way of placing myself in a position where creativity is most likely to happen. So I yes. feel stymied and yet I'm not placing myself in the place where that might actually happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see this a lot. Um, and I, I totally empathize with the situation. Um, I think, and we'll talk more about this a little bit too, but there's very much like a, um, there's, there's a combination of things that can help. Um, one is really starting the teeniest, tiniest baby step. So I think sometimes we think like, all I have to do is go to the studio. It's so like, just have to get in the car and go there, right? Like right, seems so, right. so easy. Yeah. And um, even if the, the, it's really looking at it and seeing like, what is the smallest step that moves me in that direction? How can I make it ridiculously simple? It could be as small as um, setting the keys out and setting a calendar reminder for you to like get your keys and go sit in your car. Like it can be that small. Oh. And it's really about setting that intention and making it just like this big because it's going to kind of give you this um, library of prior action that's gonna help build the trust and the confidence to keep moving along. Um, and I want it to be so small that when you think about doing it, you, your immediate thought is, of course I can do that, right? It's so easy. Like, of course I can put my keys on a countertop and go sit in my car, right? It has to be that small. So wow. we can talk, we'll talk more, but that's um, like a really baby stepping it in that direction is gonna, I think, be helpful. That is helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have about 10 more minutes, so we have more time. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Gay, for, for contributing. Um, our next uh, alumni is Al Alyssa. Uh, so Alyssa, if you give me one second, I will go ahead and you should be able to speak now. You're still muted, just so you know. There you go. Hey, um, I'm Alyssa. Uh, thank you so much for this. This has been an awesome uh, panel to be able to join. Uh, I really connected to what you said about the baby stuff because for since the pandemic hit, I, I was doing um, art shows and selling my work to stores. Um, I do embroidery. And um, but when I first started during the pandemic, you know, I just kind of like, I didn't have any of my shows to look forward to or um, that much ways to do things work to sell to create to market and so what it ended up being was I just I didn't have that motivation that I had because I was so used to that routine um and I'd also been working some part-time jobs which had ended too so I, I had this loss of structure um so when you said the baby step to kind of getting there I feel like I finally have taken a little step with just creating um, a drawing challenge, which every day I try to just do some sort of little step that maybe could be an embroidery, but kind of removing that pressure on myself that it has to be a final product. Um, because when you're making your work to sell, you always feel this pressure to like make something marketable, like how is this gonna sell? Do people like it? But like not having those shows, I really had to like, I feel like I'm having to go back to the basics of like, why do I love to make instead of look forward to, there may be some this summer, but I don't know. Um, so yeah, the baby stuff has been just like going back to the embroidery and that's like creating designs on paper that I then digitize into. Yes, I think I think absolutely. Um, just a little bit every day is very helpful. And I think um, what you were saying that before you were selling it and now um, looking at like what what do you want to be making for you is also a, another way in. So um, taking away the idea that it's for 
other and really doing it for yourself because oftentimes what you make for yourself is something that other, others also need. Right. Sorry. That's such a helpful point because sometimes I feel like when you get into that mind of like what is going to sell you, it just kind of it can become more generic instead of like something very deeply personal. Yes. Right. Thank you for sharing. Is unless you had any other question there, but except for that, the baby steps were helpful, and the um and the making for yourself. Okay, so uh, it, we have um, about four minutes, Hillary, is that correct? Oh, yeah, five, four okay. or five minutes. Four or five minutes. Okay, so um, Greta, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, not allow you to talk. So if you are free to go ahead, Greta. Oh, now you're free to go ahead, Greta. <laughs> Um, I'm Greta. I studied architecture at RISD, and I while I love to draw, the last 20 years I've been focusing on writing specifications. And I love that kind of work. I love the written word and the discipline of it. Um, I have just retired, um, but it was very stressful. <laughs> and I have just retired, and while I was working, I felt I was constantly putting some things on hold, like interests I wanted to pursue. And I'll do that when I retire. So now I've got this wonderful time that I can pursue those things. And there are a bunch of them. It's like my container has been overflowing for years. And now I've emptied it of <clears throat> a certain amount of stuff and I need to assemble those things. But I don't, some of it is committee work and um, structured things. I just don't want it to become another life of deadlines. And I want to be able to carve out some space to just, I don't know, I feel I'm a really good writer and it doesn't have to be specifications. It could be prose, um, I don't know, poetry or something. So I'm, I'm just trying to, so I still want to do the other things, but I want to be sure to carve out some time to do something who knows what. So that's, that's my story. Awesome. And do you currently have time on your calendar dedicated to just doing whatever you want creatively, whether that's writing or anything else? Well, it's only been a month and I, I've had a bunch of things to take care of. So I, I was thinking of doing that. In fact, I was thinking of sort of considering I have a, at most a four day work week and Fridays would be set aside. And, but um probably more than one day a week. I don't know. Wonderful. Yeah, but, I think that that sounds like a great plan. I, I congratulations on retiring and, and creating this space for yourself. Um, I think while um, working four days a week is amazing. Um, I think if you are looking for a, like a consistent um, space for the writing, um, consider even if it was five minutes a day, um, having it be something that is a daily practice um, and maybe that the Fridays are extra, um, but just putting that little bug in your ear a little bit to think about. Sounds great. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, makes sense. Thank you. Awesome. Of course. Okay. So we're going to move into the next section. Um, Katie, are we all good with, with people who had raised their hand? We have one person left. I didn't know if you oh. wanted to. Oh, we have two left. So it's up to you. You decide. Um, I think, I think I can take one more and then we, I'm sure we'll have more space to, do, to keep going. So, so that other person can, can do it in that section. So let's do one more quick one. Okay. So Joan, I'm going to unmute you now. So Joan Heron, you can speak when you're ready. Hi. Um, things came together with COVID. I, at the same time, I hurt my back and leg and I'm in pain quite a lot. It's, hopefully coming to an end with various therapies, but I find that I'm so under-motivated and uh, having constant pain, even if it's not severe pain, is totally distracting. I, I can't concentrate on anything. I, I would like to 
get back to painting and doing things up in my studio, but mm -hmm. I can't <clears throat> stand for very long without pain. And well, like I said, I'm, I'm under motivated. I can't be with friends who motivate me or go to the museums and things like that, or even mm -hmm. walk outside for very long. So mm -hmm. I feel really trapped and it gets to be very depressing. And that depression is kind of like a sinkhole. I can't seem to climb out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, one, I, I'm so sorry you, you're in pain. Um, and, and two, yes, I, I, I totally understand that sinkhole and that uninspired um, situation. And um, while uh, there are lots of things that uh, could be suggested, I think um, really bringing the awareness to how you're feeling is that first step of like, this is how I'm feeling and what is something that makes me feel a, a, a one degree shift in another direction, whether that's looking through your window or looking at a book that's beautiful, that inspires you, but really um, looking, that awareness that you have is, is really helpful because it's also gonna let you know when it shifts. So um, it's definitely a process, um, but one that um, a cons like that consistent awareness and shift will potentially be able to help move in that direction. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Now we're gonna we keep going. Okay. <sighs> so we talked a lot about stress our response to stress and our current situation with stress. I think that we all are very, very familiar with stress now um, and its impact. Its impact on how we feel, how we are, an impact on our creativity. Um, and so this next section, I'm gonna talk a little bit about three archetypes for creatives that are um, based upon stress responses. Um, and I want to just give a little hat tip to my mentor who um, really helped me with this. Uh, she studied Ayurveda and really that's the study of um, life. And so there are in these archetypes tendencies of humans, right? And I've applied them to um, the creative process. And so there are three and there's a lot of text, I'm gonna be fair. There's a lot of text on these slides. So my intention is not for you to like furiously write them down. My intent is as I go through them, just let them sort of paint a picture for you of that archetype. There might be one that when you hear it, you're like, that's, that's me. I see myself there, that's solidly me. There might be two that you're like, oh, sometimes I'm in this and sometimes I'm that, that's totally normal. And there might be the rare person who's like, I'm all of these things at some point. And I think really just having the awareness of when I am at my capacity, what is my tendency? Um, and we all have all of these sort of archetypes within us, but some of us, when we're at capacity, when we're stressed, there is just a definite direction that we go. And I'll share which one I am at the end, um, just so that you can get some context as well. Okay. So the first is the air creative archetype. Um, they tend towards anxiety, overwhelm, feeling scattered, uh, distraction, insomnia, forgetfulness, busyness, um, some common creative blocks that they run into are procrastination, shiny object syndrome. So like just getting distracted by all the things. Um, lots and lots of ideas, but in action. So lots of ideas, but nothing happening. Um, and then what they really crave and need to help with this sort of imbalance is uh, grounding, so grounding practices to bring them back into their bodies, um, focus, calm, consistency, and routine. So there might be some of you that immediately are like, oh, that's me. There were some of you in the chat box at the beginning that had some of these. So I'm curious if this is um, resonating with you guys. Okay. The next one is the fire creative archetype. 
So they tend towards intensity, dissatisfaction, aggression, impatience. They're very excitable, very passionate. Um, they can be competitive, can be controlling. Um, it's not all bad, right? But it's it's very much like when it's intense, it's intense. Um, they have common blocks around perfectionism, overworking, a really active inner critic. Um, and that's that little voice in your head that can be quite cruel sometimes um, telling you, you know, you did it wrong. That's not quite right. Um, you know, who do you think you are? Um, and then they need expression. They need to get that out into the world, out of their emotions and into the world. Um, calming, balance, trust not only of themselves but of the people that are around them consistency and routine okay the next one is the earth creative archetype so they tend towards stagnation numbing hibernation sometimes poor boundaries um their common blocks are they can't get started. They're uninspired. Um, when they do start, they have a lot of self doubt. Um, and then they have pleasing tendencies. So um, what do you think of this? Oh, I'll do it the way that you want to do it. Um, they need movement, uh, physical movement, um, input. So receiving inspiration, receiving inputs into their life, inspiration, con consistency, and routine. We're going to breathe again. <laughs> I know, but it's going to be great. So um, again, close your eyes. Let your feet settle. Feel yourself in your chair. And this time, we're going to breathe in through our nose. And then out through, we're gonna through your midline. So we're gonna pick a spot in your midline. It can be your third eye, your um, throat, or your heart. And you're gonna pretend there's a pinwheel. You know what those pinwheels are? Like little kids, how they blow and they move around. You can pretend there's a pinwheel in that midline. So you're gonna breathe in through your nose and then out through the pinwheel, and then in through your nose, out through the pinwheel. So inhaling. And I'm just imagining that that breath is going through that pinwheel. And I'm going to let you do this four more times on your own this time. We're getting really good at breathing. So inhale. So much breathing. Didn't know you were going to get to do that today, did you? Okay, so we're going to move into our journal prompt next. Let me get my timer up. Okay. So our next journal prompt is, which of those three archetypes feels most familiar to your current experience? I remember they were air, fire, and earth. Air was scattered like air is, um, tends towards procrastination. Fire uh, is very passionate and um, full of energy and tends towards perfectionism. And earth is feeling more stagnant and or uninspired, but also very grounded. So I'll give you three minutes here. And again, I'll give you um, the uh, 30, the, the midway uh, warning and then the 30 second warning at the end. So starting now with your pen and paper, just jot down which one feels the most familiar to your current experience. And if this feels like new information or if it feels like something that you already really knew about yourself. So starting now.
Hillary, is it possible to quickly scroll through um, mm -hmm. all three arc? Thank you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one's the air. The fire. And the earth. I hope that was helpful. And we're at about the halfway point now. About 30 seconds left. All right, and then we're gonna move into the next section. So again, we're gonna have an um, opportunity for discussion. So we're gonna raise your hand and Katie will unmute you and we can talk a little bit about the archetypes um, and how you might feel about them. Maybe it's a surprise, maybe it's something you already knew, um, but let's, let's take this time and we can have a discussion about that. I'm seeing in the chat, Hillary, that there are a lot of folks who identify as multiple. And I would just like to say to you, so do I. So you are mm -hmm. not alone. Okay, so uh, Larissa, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, allow you to talk. So feel free. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fat earth creative archetype. <laughs> There's no there. um, I thought it was really interesting that movement falls under one of my needs because that's a huge part of my life. Um, but I hadn't connected that with my creative self at all. Um, that's really interesting to, to see written down because this is like, this is completely me. Um, but I'm wondering what, like, what do I do with the information that's here? Like knowing, like, I'm like, yeah, that's totally me, but like, where do I go from here? What do I do with this information? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's a great question. Good thing we have some more time to talk about it in our presentation. <laughs> um, but uh, but yes, I think like like I've said in the previous discussion, like the awareness of your tendencies is just that awareness is huge. So knowing that you tend towards the sort of the earth archetype, knowing that if you were to um, say not have movement, not um, be actively sort of seeking inspiration and taking action that you would tend towards that stagnation, that could be helpful information for you to know for the next time that you feel stuck. Um, so that, oh, maybe I haven't had movement. Maybe I haven't um, yeah. had inputs and inspiration lately. So that awareness is the beginning and then really looking at the things that help you move from that place of stuckness to a place of balance. 
Excellent. That's great input, actually. Okay. Yeah, I think um, the movement and the embodiment for me personally, like I'm, I'm, an, I'm not an earth, I'm an air, but I also need to come back into my body and move it and be aware of it. Um, that as I recovered from being burnt out and really being disconnected um, from my creativity and from myself helps me to come back into my body and reconnect to my creativity. Um, so that movement is helpful for everybody, but I think that that embodied conscious awareness is mm -hmm. really helpful, especially if we're the earth archetype. Thanks. Yeah, of course. I started speaking, I thought I was unmuted, but I'm not. Thank you, Larissa. Um, so JL, I'm gonna go ahead and um, allow you to talk, so feel free. Hi, um, so one of the things that I'm interested in is once you know your archetypal tendencies, how do you, how can you put aside the shoulds, like the shoulds that come with life and with kids and with house and with like work stresses in order to say, okay, this is my time to be creative. I've set aside this time every day or every week or whatever it ends up being. And how do you put aside all of those shoulds in order to embrace the time for yourself to create? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it Jenny? Yeah, it is. Hi. Um, hi. So, hi. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I think um, I do talk about this later, but I, I'll, I'll touch on it now, which is um, really getting clear on the purpose for you of the creative practice. It is not by accident, it has an intention, and that intention serves you. Um, and being once you're really clear on like the purpose of it and the intention of it, I feel like it's a lot easier to protect it, whether that's through boundaries with um, family um, and work or um, communication around like, this is my time and it is sacred and um, I will do whatever is necessary to protect that time. Um, very much around like, this is, if it was, um, you know, something, board meeting, right? It, there's no doubt it would just, it would be happening, right? And so protecting in, it in the same way that those other things that are important are protected. Um, and that can, can take some doing, right? It can take some negotiation and some boundary setting and some real um, intentionality to it. Um, and it can look even like if you don't like respect the boundary that I have around this time. If you're coming into my studio when it's my studio time or you're coming into my space when it's my time to do this, um, sometimes there have to be repercussions for the breaking of that boundary. And they can be things like, you know, if this isn't working in this space, I'm gonna move to a different space. I'm gonna go somewhere else. I'm gonna go to my studio. I'm gonna lock the door or whatever it is that needs to happen. But really, I think the intentionality with the protection is going to be um, some work that could, could happen there. Okay, great. Thanks. Some mm -hmm. of the disruptions are actually coming from myself rather than external people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's really telling myself more to respect this time rather than enforcing that boundary with others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> internal <laughs> boundaries are also a thing. Um, and I think if it's something new, if it's something like a new thing that you're trying to do, going again back to those baby steps, right? Like, can I give myself 15 minutes? Okay, that seems ridiculously doable. Let's keep going. Sounds great, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, JL. Okay, um, Shelly, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to speak. So there you go. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is just fantastic. It's so timely. And I so appreciate your wisdom and time um, to help all of us. And, of course. This. and um, I was looking at the air archetype and the earth mm -hmm. archetype. And I was the one who said I have too many ideas. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. Explained it to different people it's like it's a ping pong ball, you know, boom, 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 going across everywhere, you know, and trying to rein that in. 
Mm-hmm. And I also noticed um, between air and earth that there's two um, needs that are uh, the same, which mm-hmm. are consistency and routine. And both of those mm-hmm. things I feel I'm lacking. And um, much like yourself, I came out of a, a really intense career that was incredibly demanding uh, in the UX um, industry, tech, and have suffered from an immense amount of burnout. And um, I'm no longer working in that industry and I'm on my own now and left. Um, I'm wondering, you know, as far as the consistency and routine, how how does one go about that in the midst of still burnout? Um, well, actually, side note real quick. One of the consistent things around each of the, all three of the archetypes is that need for consistency and routine. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so that is actually what we're gonna talk about next. Okay, um, great. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's great, you set me up perfectly. I really appreciate it. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, but yes, um, cr- consistency and routine in the midst of burnout um, is a challenge because it can feel like you're trying to do when you're not ready to do it mm-hmm. yet. Um, and I think um, really having some grace for yourself and some compassion for yourself that um, it's okay not to do. And that's not a popular statement in our society, right? People don't value you resting. People don't value you really filling your cup up again. They value doing. And that's kind of the, you know, the society that we're shoved into. Um, And I think the greatest gift that I can give um, to you, the greatest gift that I gave to myself is to have that compassion that if my entire body, my energy, my creativity, my inspiration, my intuition is telling me that it's not time yet, honoring that information Mm. and saying, that's okay. Um, I know that it it is there when I, when I'm going to be ready for it. And, um, and that day will come and it will come actually faster. If you can take the time now to rest and recuperate and reconnect with yourself again. Um, And there's this kind of goes into the land of shoulds a little bit because when we do this, right? And I even sometimes call it radical rest because people are like, what, why would you do that, right? Um, Really like focusing and not letting all of that noise outside say, oh, you should be doing blah, blah, blah. Or, oh, if I was you, I would, you know, shh, right? (laughs) Like it will all work out the way it's supposed to, but you have to recover and rest. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Cause uh, I, I do feel like I need that radical rest. I mean, I left my job in June and I've just been sustaining myself uh, and started a new business. And so that's not exactly radical rest. <laughs> mm. And, and um, yeah, that it's been hard to, to rest. And I think it goes back to that kind of busyness of the industry that I was in and just that nonstop go, go, go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, starting a business in the middle of a pandemic, that's a lot, right? Um, So I think uh, having, just having the awareness that you need some some recovery time and seeing what is the smallest amount that you can put in your day. It could be a 20 minute nap, which I know is also a radical idea, (laughs) but like, what is the smallest amount that you can do that's going to help? Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Hillary. Of course. A little bit more time so we can keep going. Excellent. Thank you, Shelly. Um, so, Greta, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk, so feel free. Okay. Um, I already talked. I'm the retired architect. I just want <laughs> to um, I identify with the fire archetype, I think, and I'm interested in the need for expression and trust. And um, 
I don't know if we'll be talking about that in the next part as part of a practice, but how do you, yeah, how do you learn those things? Uh, the trust, I mean, especially. I mean, trust especially is like a lifelong journey, but um, I think in a very, from a very practical perspective, um, trust could be um, doing what you say you'll do, uh, keeping promises to yourself. So this is this idea that um, we are responsible for ourselves and our results. Um, and that if I say on my calendar, this is just a really easy example. If I say in my calendar that I'm going to say the studio on Monday at four and that reminder comes up and I just ignore it. Um, I'm not building trust with myself. Yeah. If that was a meeting with somebody else and you didn't show up for it, the next time you set a meeting with that person, they would probably assume that you wouldn't show up for it. And so having that dialogue within ourselves, showing up for ourselves when we say we will, and doing that consistently over time creates trust with ourselves. Excellent. That's yeah. really good. It, Thank you. It sounds easy, but it's it's definitely a practice. <laughs> Hillary, do we have time for one more? We do. Okay, excellent. So Carrie, I'm gonna go ahead. Actually, give me one second. Carrie, you are uh, free to speak if you would like. Um Carrie, now you're free to speak if you would like. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Hillary, I just want to first say that I love what you were saying about building trust with yourself and that um, mm -hmm. that accountability with yourself and uh, that that can be this incremental process towards discipline. But um, I actually wanted to circle back to the idea of radical rest because mm -hmm. there's so, there's something so interesting to me about having this conversation uh, with a bunch of RISD alumni uh, because. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of habitual perfectionism and overwork and uh, almost a striving towards that sleepless, I'm going to work mm. towards a finished creative product or you know something to prove myself. I feel like a lot of that habitual behavior, um, I, and I'm not saying that it's not part of my makeup because it is also part of my makeup, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do, um, when I look at those patterns, I, I definitely connect them to my experience at RISD. So um, I'm mm -hmm. just reflecting that back because I think that it, it's, it's just an interesting thing to think about. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and I also wondered if, um, so I'm not sure if this is as, as a, uh, as much question for you, Hillary, but I do wonder if there's anything about the culture at RISD that is maybe changing or that might change in terms of uh, responding to this year and uh, mental health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one, I just want to also acknowledge, yes, um, that was 100% my experience, um, that, you know, working all night kind of stuff. Um, and was very much part of the inspiration for why I wanted to offer this because I had to go and learn how to not do that version in the world. Um, and going into advertising did not, that, that didn't work, <laughs> right? Because I just went straight into the belly of things and was like, yeah, this is what we do. We work all night, right? Like, um, yeah. and that's fine in the beginning, but it's not sustainable. Um, and uh, okay. this idea that, we're in this creative journey for the long haul and that it has to be sustainable. We have to integrate care um, and awareness in order to keep going. Um, and this was something that I actually brought up with Katie when we were talking about this presentation because I thought it was so important and, and was curious as well if there was some shifts in the culture at RISD. So um, Katie, I'll let you um, answer a little bit of that because I think you, you're the best person to um, say what's currently shifting or not shifting. Sure, um, so I'm not as uh, student facing as I used to be in a previous role, but I can tell you that we, RISD as an institution is really, especially this past year, trying to do everything that we can to make sure that we are supporting our students' mental health. We understand, you know, how rigorous and, and 
completely overwhelming it can be sometimes to study during a normal year and we can't even begin to imagine what our students are are feeling during a pandemic year so we are trying to do what we can to uh, be as supportive as possible from a um, standpoint of a staff member we are I can say that RISD has been really wonderful in supporting us on our almost year-long journey of working remotely and um I appreciate that. It has not been an easy year, uh, as I'm sure everybody here can agree. Um, and it has been really nice to know that there, I have the support of my institution behind me if if I need, you know, a breather, which I did a lot of the breathing earlier with you, Hillary. So thank you for that. I needed it. So yeah, but those are all very good points, Carrie. Thank you for bringing them up. Thanks. Thanks for your response to to them. It's something that comes up in conversation regularly, even pre-pandemic, with other other RISD graduates um, uh, uh, and in alumni communities, and um, and even with friends, you know, who who of course were in other institutions where um, where you know there there the idea that rigor also means like sleeplessness seems to be intertwined, you know, um, and, and, and similarly with success. Um, so uh, thanks for your response. I, I, I hope I, and I, it's something, again, that I think about a lot because I'm a teacher and I work with, um, I work with students who are on the spectrum and have complex learning profiles. So we always address mental health and the idea of safety before moving on to a state of learning and creativity. So I really related to that when you were talking about that earlier, Hillary, and um, yeah. and and I and I can't help but think, you know, like the, that that's important for everyone, and so I, I do uh, I, I do hope that there is a shift in the culture at RISD. And thanks for taking my question. Thank you. So that is everybody who wanted to uh, contribute. Okay, awesome. We'll keep going. So as previously mentioned, all of the archetypes benefit from the consistent routine of creative practice. So that's sort of like the good news, right? Like we all have these challenges, um, but having consistent routine is helpful for all of them. Um, so I thought that was like really like the silver lining for me. So we're gonna talk about uh, resilient practice, um, what that is and, um, and what some of the elements are of it. So I call this an anchored and awakened creative practice. Um, for me, it is a purposeful practice that provides a way to catalyze the chaos that we experience internally and externally. So that was even pre-pandemic, but even now with everything going on, I feel like it's even more important um, as a way of really taking what's coming at us and being able to process it so that we can uh, function at our best. Um, it creates a consistent connection to ourselves and it also creates safety, which we need to be creative. Safety, increase the ability to predict the immediate future and accurately respond to your current environment, the opposite of threat and a creative routine that you know is coming, that's the prediction, and then accurately respond, that's the action that you're taking within your creative um, practice so that you are building safety into your creative practice because it is a requirement. So the question is, how could your creative practice be more supportive of your current container that we talked about and your tendencies? So this isn't a journal prompt just yet, um, but it's more of a, of a question for yourself so that we're, we're sort of building upon what we've already talked about is that your practice, the function of it is to support you, the container that we talked about that's, that's rising, and then the, the stress response tendencies. So really architecting the creative practice to support the container and the tendencies. So I think of a creative practice as having two fundamental sections, um, the being section and the doing section. I think of the doing as sort of like the, the lattice here and the being is the, the plant that's growing on the lattice. You have to have 
both, in my opinion. Um, if you were to just have the being practices, um, there would be a lot of ideas, but they wouldn't come to fruition. If you were to have just the doing practices, there might be a lot of work, but it might not really be expressing what you want or connecting with the heart of what you're trying to express or process. And so they're very much in partnership with each other. Um, some You could compare this to so like a yin and a yang um, or a structure with, um, with just more of an organic thing. So those two things work in tandem. And I'm going to talk about um, three elements of being and three elements of doing. Um, there are so many more, but I tried to keep it um, pared down enough that we would have time to talk about some of them. Um, so I'll talk about the being elements first. So there are a lot of being elements in a creative practice, um, but the three that I chose here are calm, connection, and cultivation. So I'm gonna take each one in turn and give um, some examples of what I mean in each. So calm, um, I define this as quieting the noise internally and externally so you can begin to listen more fully. So um, this was the first real step that I took that brought me closer to reconnecting with my own creativity. Um, and it's going to be different for each person, right? Your creative practice, if there's you know, 7 billion people in the world, there, there could be 7 billion different creative practices. So this is really um, about you looking at what are the calming practices that um, really resonate for you. So here are just a few examples. Um, limiting inputs. So I know that um, there's been a lot of folks who have had CNN on all the time and um, really bringing awareness to the inputs that are coming into us. Um, that can be everything from the news to um, social media, to um, you know, books, comics, um, movies. Um, if you are feeling sensitive and really tender, watching a really violent movie can, can really impact you and affect your level of um, calm. Um, so really just looking at like, is this input serving me or not? Um, one of my favorite calming practices is journaling. Um, it's something that is part of my own creative practice and it really helps me to express um, sort of the, the noise rattling around in my head and it helps to quiet it um, so that then I can begin to, to focus and do my work. So um, I highly, highly recommend journaling. Um, it it's you know, not for everybody, but I think that um, even just having a morning pages practice um, where you just sort of automatically write whatever comes into your mind um, is really helpful for getting sort of the noise out of your head. Um, meditation. So this one is um, is very is gaining in popularity and um, is something that most people know about. Um, but it, it is one of I think one of the most helpful things um, that I have found for calming myself and calming the noise. Um, and allowing me to listen more fully to myself. Um, for those of you who are hesitant to try meditation, um, one minute counts, um, 30 seconds can count. We've actually done some, uh, some nice breathing meditations here. So even all of that counted as well. So um, there are a lot of ways into meditation. So um, if it's something that might pique your interest, um, that's worth looking into. Uh, deep breathing. So this is something that we've done together now um, a couple times, and it really is helpful. I have find it incredibly helpful for moving the sort of tightness in my chest out, for calming me, for bringing awareness back to my body. Um, this is something that I just, if I could just have like 15 deep breaths a day, I feel like my, my day would be better. So um, this is something I, I definitely recommend. Um, deliberate rest. Also, we've talked about this as radical rest. So that is that in, you know, kind of radical notion that you can rest, you can not do, you can take a nap, you can get a full eight hours of sleep, you can um, go and, and do a, a really 
calming meditative yoga practice, for example. Um, so really intentionally um, resting when you need it. I think one of the things that um, folks have been surprised about during the pandemic is that they are exhausted um, and they couldn't figure out why. But, you know, for example, it's like, well, I got eight hours of sleep, uh, but I'm exhausted and I can't figure out why. Well, there's all the, those stressors in your container that you're just not accounting for. And so really being aware of that exhaustion and finding rest when you need it. Yoga is a wonderful way to calm, especially restorative and yin yoga. Can't recommend that enough and, and um, really think there's something to it um, for accessing creativity in the body. Um, and then grounding practices. So this is sort of by definition for, for yourself. There might be something that you find that really calms you. Um, it could be something like a weighted blanket. It could be walking in the mud. It could be anything that you sort of feel that feeling of like connected to the ground. As the air archetype, this is something that I've had to figure out for myself because I need something to bring me back to earth. Um, so hopefully this is a good examples for you of like what some being practices that you could integrate into your creative practice could be for calm. The next one is connection. So um, I define this as active listening as a collaborative conversation with yourself or your highest self. So that, that little voice inside of your, your self um, that is uh, really the one, I think where the, the, the seat of creativity, the seat of intuition um, and cultivating that relationship with that part of yourself. So I referenced Morning Pages before and that is from uh, Julia Cameron's The Artist Way which is a practice of taking 20 minutes and letting whatever words come out on a piece of paper um, and with a pen come out every morning as a way of sort of clearing out the cobwebs, clearing out the information in your mind each morning. Um, that is one of the first steps that I took when I was reconnecting to my creativity and I, I just can't recommend that one enough. Um, emotional processing. So this one is one that um, is, it might not be that, common or I've heard of, but essentially it's when an emotion comes, not just sort of like ignoring it or like getting over it real fast or, you know, just sort of moving on, but really it's a process of sitting with the emotion and feeling all of it just kind of letting it come. The average um, duration of an emotion is 90 seconds. Um, and we are not taught to, to feel those emotions, not taught to process them. Um, and so um, that act of letting your feelings be felt um, is, a, is an act of connection. The next one is somatic inquiry, which is kind of a fancy way of saying, paying attention to how your body feels. Somatic refers to body. Um, and this one is, I think, particularly fascinating because so much, um, emotion and memory is stored in the body and being able to bring awareness to the body is often a really interesting way into some emotion and some creativity. Um, it could be, you know, tightness that's held in your shoulders. And then when you kind of pay attention to it, realizing that like, maybe you felt like there was something that happened that you weren't aware of and just getting curious about how your body is connected to your emotions and to your creativity. Uh, mindful movement. Um, this also could be yoga, but also could be taking um, a mindful walk. It could be uh, washing the dishes with awareness. Um, it can be anything as long as you are doing it with intention um, and with awareness. This next one I love, nature immersion. It um, is something that 100% I feel connects you to not only yourself, but to something greater than yourself. Um, and at our house, we call it vitamin N. And sometimes just going for a walk outside can be transformative. And so maybe there is uh, some element of going into nature that is gonna be helpful for your creative practice. The next one is intuitive practices. And intuition is something that, um, you know, wasn't something that I was taught about in school um, and 
we don't really value it necessarily in society. We, we put a lot of um, attention on logic and the brain and um, really paying attention to um, what is pulling you forward? What are you curious about? What are you wondering about? What is this, the part of you that wants you to go do something that doesn't logically make sense? Um, and this can be anything from just simply bringing awareness and paying attention to what your intuition wants you to know. Um, but it's something that I think is a really interesting and integral part of a creative practice. Um, especially I find it in painting and things like that where you're just doing the next thing without thinking about it, you're just doing it and it's coming to you from an intuitive place. So cultivating that intuitive practice in your creative practice. And then cultivation. So how will you cultivate what's calling you? So there may be um, lots of ideas bouncing around in your head. How are you paying attention to what is showing up for you, showing up consistently, um, paying attention and listening to what's calling you, uh, using discernment to figure out which projects you should move into, seeing if there's patterns that pop up over time as you're keeping track and as you're journaling, um, bringing focus to the things that you want to pay more attention to and creating that commitment around them. Sometimes that commitment starts on the inside and moves to the outside. So really just paying attention to what is it that is really calling you and moving you forward and how will you, from an internal place, practice this awareness and discernment and commitment to it. Um, so figuring out what that looks like for you. The next section is the doing elements. So these are what uh, sort of the external elements that we think of often when we think of a creative practice. Um, and I've tried to take a different sort of lens on these. Um, so hopefully that will feel helpful. They are uh, calendar, conditions, and community. So calendar, we talked a little bit about protecting our creative practice before. So really getting clear on the intention of the creative practice, being clear on what your priorities are, cultivating boundaries so that you can protect the practice, being clear about what you're committing to and what you are willing to say no to. So sometimes when we have a creative practice and it's not something that's established, you have to say no to something else in order to say yes to your creative practice. And that can be also something that is challenging and hard. Um, and then communication. I have this time set aside. I need it for this reason and I'm going to protect it at all costs. So your creative practice needs to live on a calendar. It needs to have a time and a place. But in addition to having a calendar with a practice time on it, you have to be clear on the priorities, the boundaries, the commitment and the way that you communicate it so that it is protected. Conditions. So creating and caring for your creative spaces. Um, this isn't just internal, it isn't just external spaces, it's also internal spaces. Um, oftentimes uh, I'll look around my house and be like, oh my gosh, this is what the inside of my head looks like. And I've had clients who have said like, I really wanna be writing or painting, but my office is a disaster and I feel like I'm procrastinating by cleaning it. Well, the impetus to clean the space is telling you what needs to happen, right? It's telling you that like, this is something that's in the way and it's because it impacts your creative practice at some level. And so really looking at evaluating and auditing the different spaces. So your home, office, studio, um, looking at each object and saying like, is this positively or negatively affecting my, my creativity and my creative practice, or is it neutral? And if it's positive, you get to keep it. And if it's negative, you get to get rid of it. And if it's neutral, it gets to maybe stay and be evaluated. Too many neutral things lead to un like not being inspired and too many, you know, it just tends to be, to, to be cluttered. So I think really just taking the time and 
doing it teeny tiny chunk by teeny tiny chunk. Like I'm not in any way saying like, go evaluate your entire home tomorrow. Like take it like drawer by drawer, room by room um, and do it sy systemically and methodically um, because it does make an impact. It does influence your creativity, your creative practice. So doing that for your home, your studio, your work, um, pre-pandemic, I would also say transitional spaces, things like your car, um, your purse is a transitional space. Um, the, like the entryway into your home is a transitional space. Um, they, they do have an impact um, and, and uh, really just being aware of them. This next one is not a popular one to tell people to evaluate, but social media and actual social outlets like your, your friends and family. Um, if you are surrounding yourself by um, with people who are not supportive, that's going to have an impact on your creativity. If you're surrounding yourself with people who um, are supportive, that's also going to have an impact. Um, if you're going into social media and immediately moving into comparison and feeling not good enough, that's going to impact your creativity. Um, and then also in digital spaces. So things like your phone, um, your computer desktop, um, any sort of spaces that are digital. Um, you know, if you go to say write in the morning and you're on your computer and you suddenly find that there's 25 tabs open and a, a desktop that's a disaster, it's pretty easy to just go on over to those other tabs or to go ahead and start cleaning something up and get distracted from what you're really wanting. So it's not serving you. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and, and it is not overwhelming, can be done in small chunks. <laughs> And then the last one is community. So I define this as a shared vulnerability towards a common practice. Um, RISD alumni is a great example, um, but basically it's cultivating a space that has accountability, camaraderie, um, some sort of additional like vulnerable sharing or uh, cooperative sharing um, and support. So finding people who are um, also trying to do a similar thing. Um, can be very supportive of a creative practice and is often missing and often in these pandemic times is something that people are 100% just craving, just really, really want that connection, that tribe to connect to. Um, and so just not underestimating the, the power of a community here. <sighs> We're going to breathe one last time. So this one, you get to breathe however you want. Um, and just five deep breaths, any of the ways we did the fog, the mirror, we dig the pinwheel and we did the deep breath. So you get to pick which one you like, but we're going to do five breaths. Then we'll do the journal prompt and then we'll have some discussion time. So close your eyes, get your feet settled on, get your, your stuff settled in your chair and then inhale. Just let your eyes flutter open. Hi, welcome back. Hopefully that was helpful. So now that we've talked about some of the different elements that could go into your creative practice, um, I'm happy to go back and go, go refresh on them. But essentially what I really want to know and that we'll spend, the, the, we'll spend three minutes on now is what does your ideal creative practice look like? What are the elements of the being and the doing that are going to be helpful for you? And in order to commit to it, what do you need? So we'll start now.
I'm about halfway. About 30 seconds left. Okay, hopefully that was enough time. I know it's a big prompt, so feel free to continue um, with it as needed after. So essentially what we have done is, is talked about your container. So what are your current results given your capacity? We talked about that level. Your response, so which archetypal response resonated with you the most and, and brings awareness to what you tend to do. And then we talked about just quickly six being and doing elements of a creative practice and how could they could support your container and your response so that your practice is really supporting you where you are today and what you need. So putting it all together creates the creative practice. And so now we can discuss, but before we go and discuss, I just wanna say that um, there is, um, an, I have a, just a special offer at the end for folks. So if, um, if you aren't wanting to discuss, just know that at the end there, the, there will be um, an offer and um, it will be in the replay and in the notes. So just in case people need to hop off or anything like that, just wanna let you know. So with that, uh, we can open it up uh, for discussion about the elements that you'll bring into your creative practice to make sure that it's gonna be supportive for you. Great, thank you. So Greg Kanan, my good friend, I'm gonna allow you to talk right now. There you go, Greg. Okay, hi. Hi, Katie. <laughs> um, hi, Hillary. Uh, thank hi. you. For uh, this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I, I'm actually coming at this from uh, maybe a, a little bit of a different perspective. I'm not an artist. Uh, I was at one time a long time ago, but my day job is something that is not very artistically driven. And in the last, I want to say five to six months, I've, I've recommitted to starting a creative practice again. And um, so this has been actually really helpful for me, just listening um, and then obviously listening to everyone else as they participate too. But it's, it's, you know, I'm thinking very heavily about what my ideal practice looks like. And I think in many respects, it looks like, uh, I think any, any creative practice, it's something that you, you can do, or at least, <laughs> how, how do I describe this? Um, as, as something that I think may, maybe most artists would, would look, look for, something that you can sort of slip in and not, not feel like you have to work too hard to get into a rhythm and uh, something that you feel, or at least that I feel, I feel confident that I can get into it. But then if things aren't working, I can just put it aside, walk away and not feel like I've wasted my time um, and that it'll come back to me when, when, when it's ready or when I'm ready and not worry that I've lost it. And I'm not quite, and I'm not there yet. I mean, I've just started. So for me, it is very much like if I miss a day or if I miss two days, I start to get that dread. Uh Oh, am I falling off the wagon again? Because I've done this before where I've tried to start and 
I'll draw, I'll do some drawing or sketching and then two, three, four, five days pass. And then before you know it, I haven't drawn in a year, two years, three years. And um, so I, you know, I'm working very hard and, and, and some, some of the prompts that you've given uh, just even in the last couple of slides have been really good for me to think about how to, how to build, how to build that practice. So that, that's where I'm going. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, I th I'm also just want to throw out there that especially when you're coming back to something for the first time and you're really at those beginning stages, I'm 100% not above bribing myself. Like I could have a piece of chocolate if I, if I can do 15 minutes of writing or, you know what I mean? Like I am 100%, I have kids. So I, I'm always like, huh, what can it, gummy bears? Like what works? Like, I don't care what works you just as long as it happens. You know what I mean? So like figuring what my point is is figuring out a way to make it be pleasurable is another way in of like I get to light my candle I get to have my favorite mug my favorite cup of tea and I get to have a scone and I get to do the things that I love and it it the same way that you would get a puppy or a child to do something in the beginning it works for this too yeah I, I think that's great and actually one of the things I've started doing I have little kids too and um <laughs> I have a six-year-old daughter and we, we haven't made this regular, but I think we're going to try to make it a regular thing where we'll do, we'll have drawing time together and mm -hmm. usually right before bed. So that's when our, our youngest is getting put down. So she's not in the way, um, but mm -hmm. you know, we'll set up at a table and we'll sit and we'll draw together and, you know, maybe I'll put on some music, but it, it, it's like a nice time for us to connect, but also a good period for us to both exercise some artistic expression. So. Mm, I love that. Yes. That's wonderful. So. Yeah, I think, and yeah, I love that it's just a daily thing and it's bite sized um, and it has a really consistent, this is a, like a little habit trick, right? It has a trigger, which is bedtime, and it has an end point, which is it's time to go to bed. So it's really like a finite amount of time, um, which is really helpful. And, you know, that connection that you feel in doing it is kind of like the reward. So you've got a perfect habit situation sort of set up for yourself. I did it again. I was muted. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. Uh, Linda, I'm going to go ahead and I will um, allow you to talk now. So go for it. Hi. Um, I, I, think, I think the timing is great because building off of what Greg had just said, I, it's been, I would say, 20 years probably since I formally was drawing anything. And I happened through targeted Facebook ad to see um, something in Seattle and I'm on the East Coast. So at 9.30 at night on Fridays, I have my me time for two and a half hours where I'm sketching and it's fantastic. Mm. And so mm. I want to take it to the next step. And the stuff I'm doing is I do a lot of things that are creative or creative like, but this time that you have just expressed like, this is about creative practice. I wrote down some bullet points for me that I feel like I was not going to get to without your help. And one is time on the calendar to explore, but then to take that time seriously and not confuse it with, I specifically wrote gardening time because I've gotten way into my garden. That's not the same. Last year, I pretended it was. Look how creative I am with my colors. It, it, who cares? That's not it. That's not taking a picture. That's not drawing. That's not the other things. And I find too, and this is where Greg comes into it. I've been, my kids are super creative and love to do stuff, but I find that they commandeer very quickly. So we'll all be drawing together. And then they're like, and then we should, and now we'll make, and it's like, great. But then I got lost again. So the difference this time is I can do all those things. And frankly, when I do stuff, then my kids are like, ooh, and then we're going to, and they do. So great. I will be a great like model for them. However, this time it's going to be mine. I'm going to make sure that this time is for me to explore. So I put on the calendar for explore time. And should I not do anything with it or take pictures of something stupid? Who cares? It's digital. I'm doing it that way this time. And that's because of you. I thank you in advance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I love that. That makes me so happy. Um, yes. I love the awareness that you're bringing to this, that like, this is, this is one thing and I'm needing this other thing in addition, just that awareness and then really setting it up and protecting it. That's everything. So good job, you. 
Thank you, Linda. Um, Kristen, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so you can feel free to talk if you'd like. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay, great. Um, I think this is all incredibly helpful and I really appreciate it. Um, one thing that also Greg said, um, I don't know if he really meant it in this, these terms, but he said something about time wasting and it, it ties in with one of the other things you were talking about of like everything else in your life kind of getting in the way. And be, because I have the luxury of like, I don't need to sell what I'm making. Um, it's, it's really like, it should be, could be all exploratory, right? Just, which is like the ultimate creative experience in some ways. I get totally caught up in this idea of like, well, what the hell am I doing? Like, I'm not selling this. I'm not, you know, doing it for any particular reason. And it, and I like have sort of talked myself into the fact that it's somehow wasted time. Um, and it, you know, it goes to sort of that being doing thing a little bit, but I wonder if you could maybe address that a little. Sure. I, I, I of course have questions, <laughs> but um, I think this idea of wasting, wasting time, I think really speaks to um, intention. So if um, there's sort of like this moment where I feel like you're exploring and you're, you're having this creative outlet and this practice, and sometimes there's a moment where it becomes a thing, right? Like it becomes a project. And sometimes that never happens and sometimes it does. And there's something that I feel like has been ingrained in us, whether from society or from capitalism, I'm not quite sure, but it's like, there has to be like a point, right? Like a purpose. And in order for it to feel like it's not wasting time and I feel like I want to take that and I want to turn it upside down because <laughs> I want the purpose to be enough, right? And that there is no such thing as wasting as long as it's something that you need and you're enjoying and um, is beneficial in some way for you. So it might be about bringing awareness to why are you doing this? How does it feel when you do it? How does it feel when you don't do it? And what do you really want to get out of it? Because if those things are answered, I feel like the wasting is really coming from the outside as a perspective as a, or, a, or it's coming as a self-judgment. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that little, like that little, you know, critic on the shoulder, that, that judging person on the side, sometimes we just need to say like, I hear you. I hear you. Thank you for your input, but you don't get to drive. I'm going to keep going and doing this thing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so we don't have anybody else right now, um, and I didn't know, turning it over to you, Hillary, what you wanted to do now? Um, well, I think we can go ahead and sort of wrap up. Um, oh, actually, Gay Shemp oh. just asked to talk, so give me one second. There we go. Okay. Gay, you're able to talk now. Uh, well, I had one thought, too, It's and, and it has to do with the uh, doing section, that mm. um, so. I'm, I also teach art and I never think of taking classes for myself, but I think mm -hmm. that professional development for artists, um, I know that that is important and maybe that's something that could like, you know, bump me out of this uh, mm -hmm. inertia. And so mm -hmm. I guess it would be online now because I know our art centers around here are, are not offering mm -hmm. uh, studio classes, but I just wanted to throw it out there that maybe you know, that's another tool we could use. Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I, at our house, we've taken a couple of the um, continuing education um, classes that RISD offers, workshops. I personally love like once they allow us to do it again, like a creative retreat is mm -hmm. like everything that I could ever want in my life. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think absolutely. There's something about, you know, being a perpetual student constantly striving for growth 
and having structure and accountability. Yeah. Um, and that is essentially a course or a class. And um, we, you know, we need that, that structure, that lattice, right, to overlay that creative practice onto. And so 100% agree. I, I also think that it might be valuable to take um, some kind of class in something that's not my discipline so that mm -hmm. I don't end up copying some artists that I'm studying with and that I would take from that, digest it and have it come out in my own media. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great idea. Love it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Gay. Um, and like Hillary mentioned, CE uh, through RISD Continuing Education, they do have their spring catalog available online now with everything being digital. So feel free to check it out. You might find something new and exciting. I will do that. Thank you. Oh, very welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we have Joan is uh, would like to speak. So Joan, go ahead. Hi. I, I love that expression of having explore time. Um, but how do we get out of the mindset of when we're doing explore time that there's supposed to be a purpose for that? There's supposed it's supposed to lead to an end result, a, a product, as opposed to, which of course is the guilt of um, how do we just use it for ourselves to play and have fun and get that thing out of the back of our head? Well, I'm doing this because it's going to lead to something more productive. Yes, that is the challenge. Um, I feel like it's a little bit about expectation. Um, and I think if we can come at it from like a, like a beginner's mind or a child's mind of just wonder and play, that we can start to quiet a little bit that like expectation outcome. Um, one of the things that I love is so much is about the process and not the product. And remembering that it doesn't have to be something at the end, as long as all along the way, that process was something that was beneficial. Okay, thank you. Of course. Okay, well, I think we're gonna keep going unless Katie has anybody else. We only have like five more minutes, so. Sure. There's one more person, um, but okay. it's up to you if you want. Okay, uh, Brianna, if you wanna go ahead. Thank you so much for um, giving your time today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say this exploratory um, guilt thing about you know not having a purpose. I've kind of cultivated a private art practice over the past couple of years. And at first I was a little bit kind of lost, but I, as a designer, I came down to like, well, what is my objective? How am I exploring as a designer? So I gave myself clear parameters and that really helped. And so during the pandemic, I've made probably over 50 paintings, but I did come to a place where I was very stuck because of being a casualty of, of uh, institutionalized racism and I stopped making art altogether and I just colored. And it really mm -hmm. helped me get past like that bump where I had to like produce something. So even playing in a certain way can also help you get past um, any, any roadblocks that are in your way. But I also felt that just having that parameter to begin with, with my private art practice, not for sale or you know, any, any sp specific reason besides wanting to flush out certain ideas. I love that. Yes. That, that playing and just letting it be is wonderful and drawing and coloring. I love it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Brianna. Okay. We have nobody else in the queue. Okay. <laughs> um, so just wanted to offer this for anybody who registered, who showed up, who's seeing this in the replay. Um, we've talked a lot about information today. So just like so much information. And I'm all along the way, tried to, to do some integration practices, but um, I want to offer just 90 minutes phone call for anybody who um, is interested, basically to continue 
integrating this information. Maybe it's um, looking at the creative practice that you want to um, create and, and what you feel like is in the way. But this is my thank you to RISD. This is my thank you um, to all of you for joining me. Um, it is not a sales call, don't worry. It is simply just a way to continue on with this idea of taking this information and integrating it into your life because information without integration is not action. Um, so I wanted to just make sure that it's super clear. You can go to the website. It's lightheartsociety.com forward slash RISD. There's um, a little bit of information and then a button and it schedules time on my calendar. Um, I have opened up time specifically for you all. Um, obviously, I'm just one person, so I don't know that I'll be able to see everybody, but I am pretty confident that those who are interested will be able to find a time. Um, but I just wanted to have this um, be really a thank you from me to you um, and um, just say that I just really am so thankful for getting the honor of being here and getting to talk to all of you. So thank you so much. Um, and I just, I appreciate the space and the time. So thank you. Thank you, Hillary. This was wonderful. I, it really was. I enjoyed every part of it. Um, thank you for everybody who registered and for who attended and participated. This was really, really great. I love the ability of everybody being able to ask their questions and share live. Um, please keep an eye on your email. We're doing these sort of lifelong learning webinars throughout the next few months, and we would love to see you attend a future one. So thank you again, and have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye. Thank you.